The Giza Plateau, one of the most extensively studied and highly controversial historical sites in the world. The Great Pyramids are unquestionably one of the greatest feats of engineering in human history. Even in modern times, many questions remain about how they were constructed, and this has contributed directly to all manner of alternative theories questioning who built the pyramids, when, what was the purpose. So what do we really know about them? The mainstream or consensus view, the one that is propounded by most historians and Egyptologists, holds that the 4th dynasty Egyptians built them around the 26th century BCE. The dissenters from that view can generally be grouped fairly under what I'm going to call the higher civilization theory for the purpose of this discussion. The details definitely do vary considerably, but adherents of the higher civilization theory would in general agree that it was a much older and more advanced civilization that built the Great Pyramids, the Sphinx, the other monuments of Giza. The beginning of the Holocene period just after 10,000 BCE is a date that gets thrown around quite a bit, partly due to climatological and geological instability at that point, but there are some that would push the date much earlier than that, even 30,000, 40,000, etc. BCE. There's also quite a variety in terms of what civilization is given credit. Aliens, Atlanteans, someone else entirely. Before going any further, I really need to address an elephant in the room here. Over the last couple of decades, this divide has really become something of a flashpoint for tribalism, with all manner of accusations going back and forth. It's become fairly common for advocates of the mainstream view to accuse those who believe in higher civilization theory of racism. For example, claiming that the great construction achievements of Roman, Greek, other civilizations are not treated with nearly the same level of scrutiny and skepticism that those of the Egyptian culture are. Then from the other direction, the accusations generally center around corruption, cover-up, dishonesty, lack of scientific rigor, not wanting to look at evidence that might change the official narrative. I believe it's critical to recognize that while there are elements of truth here, there are also many people who simply come to a different conclusion than we do when they assess the facts. It isn't fair to assume that if someone does that, it's because of some ulterior motive. I'm certainly always a proponent of respectful, free expression of ideas, but the emphasis there is on respectful. I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you in terms of what I'm getting right or wrong in the assessments I'm making in this discussion. But I also do want to encourage any viewers who are passionate about these subjects to express your vitriol towards the arguments made and not the people making them. Let's treat each other with basic dignity and respect, even, and in fact, especially in cases where we vehemently disagree. It's also important to clearly recognize that just because there's a consensus on one side of an issue, that bare fact does not mean that's where the truth lies. Certainly there are myriads of examples in human history where the consensus has simply been dead wrong. So as we've alluded to, one primary reason for the belief in the higher civilization theory is simply coming to the conclusion that the 4th dynasty Egyptians could not have built the Great Pyramids. They simply did not have the capability of doing so. And there's some validity in this. There are some aspects of how they were built that we can't explain. And so it's a very germane point worth investigating. What evidence do we have that the 4th Dynasty Egyptians built the Great Pyramids? One piece of evidence to consider is the Journal or Diaries of Mer, M-E-R-E-R, -E which were discovered near the Red Sea in 2014. And from them, we know that Mer was somebody of fairly high rank, had the title of inspector, and his team transported by boat white limestone to Giza from that area. It is thought that these were used for the exterior casing stones of the Great Pyramid. Now it's been estimated 30 blocks every 10 days or 200 per month that were delivered. Probably not for a small project and there were probably other materials being delivered from various areas. Mirror's diary states itself to be from the 27th year of Khufu. It also references Khufu's half-brother, Ankhaf, who we know from other sources. Mer refers to Ankhaf as the overseer of Rashi Khufu, that is, the basin of Khufu, Today we know it as the harbor of Giza, which we do have geological evidence for. It was dug out by the Egyptians to allow ships easier access to the pyramid sites. The idea is the harbor would fill during flood season and boats would be able to sail in and deliver materials. The building project that Mera was working on is named over a hundred times as the Horizon of Khufu. Although Horizon is an imperfect translation, something like Mountain of Light might be more appropriate. Sounds an awful lot like a pyramid, doesn't it? Then there's the workers' village or town that's been discovered at the Giza Plateau. And they found literally hundreds of thousands of stone tools. Curiously enough, no intact copper tools that I'm aware of. Vast quantities of metallurgical waste relating to building copper items of some kind. 
They found massive bread molds, bones of sheep and cattle slaughtered to feed the workers. The best evidence seems to indicate that this village dates to not the time of Khufu, but the time of Khafre, whose reign started 10 to 15 years later after Khufu's death. So while this evidence doesn't directly relate to the Great Pyramid of Khufu, certainly it relates to what the Egyptians' construction methods and activities were in this general time frame. And of course, how Khafre's pyramid was constructed, the second of the Great Pyramids, and nearly as large as Khufu's. There's no other reasonable purpose that I have ever heard suggested for all of this, if not to build the pyramid. So we have contemporary writings, we have physical evidence from the time that we can fit with the rest of what we know about Egyptian history, and reasonably come to the conclusion that the 4th Dynasty Egyptians were the builders. All of this stands in stark contrast to the level of direct evidence that we have for the higher civilization theory, which is to say, none whatsoever. It isn't just that we don't have any evidence that they built the pyramids. The pyramids and similar structures are the only evidence at all that you could put for their existence. We have no ruins of their cities. We have no tools. We have no writings. We have no indication that they were even present. Quite self-evidently, a massive construction project such as the pyramids requires a large, prosperous civilization. Infrastructure, focused effort by large numbers of skilled labor. How could a civilization have achieved this and then left no record of those capabilities? A counter-argument that's often raised to this is that absence of evidence does not mean evidence of absence. In other words, just because we haven't found evidence of an older advanced civilization does not mean there wasn't one. But the very people who raise that often rely on absence of evidence themselves. For example, if you say that ancient Egyptians were not advanced enough to build the Great Pyramids, what are you basing that on? We found certain types of tools and techniques that they used, and we haven't found others. Much like from a broader archaeological perspective, we divide cultures into those that were in the Bronze Age, or in the Stone Age, or prior to that, cultures that were agricultural, or prior to the Neolithic era, all based on what evidence we find within the ruins of their settlements and activities. Even if you do grant the conclusion that the Egyptians weren't advanced enough to build the Great Pyramids, it's a much simpler and more logical solution to say, well, they must have had methods and techniques that we don't know about. At least then you're working off the basis of a large and prosperous civilization that we know existed, rather than adding on top of the challenge of figuring out methods and techniques that we don't think were evident at a point in history, having then to figure out some reason why an entire massive civilization would leave no record of itself. None of this means in any way that we're proving the higher civilization theory wrong. It's simply an assessment of what does the best evidence we have access to indicate. It's incredibly difficult to prove a negative. There's a bookcase in the room where I'm recording this, and if you picked a book at random off one of the shelves and asked me to prove to you that I haven't read it at all in the last two months, there's no way I could do that. On the other hand, ask if I've ever read a book, and it's a totally different question. We can discuss who the author is, who the publisher is, when it was written, what's it about, and what are some key passages that I found personally memorable. And if I have read the book, I'm going to be able to demonstrate it by answering those kinds of questions. If I haven't, that gives you a clear conclusion that way as well. This is the way we need to approach historical study. What does the positive evidence that's available tell us? Certainly we can and should adjust our perspectives as more evidence is uncovered. In 1800, there was a lot of doubt as to whether the city of Troy ever existed. And then about 20 years later, we found what we think is the location where it was. As of 1920, there was no knowledge of any significant ancient civilization in the Indus River Valley. Since then, over 100 sites have been discovered, and we're just scratching the surface on excavating them, but it's clear, and there's a consensus, that civilization did exist. But in both of these cases, and many others, this shift started with the discovery of the evidence. That's the key point. Getting back to the pyramids, carbon dating is another important line of evidence for us to consider. You can't carbon date the stone in the pyramids, obviously. But there is organic material in the mortar between the rocks. Fragments of wood and charcoal have been found, such as the famous Dixon relics. These were found in the Queen's Chamber by British engineer Wayman Dixon, 1872. And there were three items. A copper hook, a dolerite ball, and fragments of cedar wood, and the cedar being the most important for our dating purposes. For decades, it was thought that the cedar was lost. However, it was rediscovered at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland in late 2019, after having been placed in their Asian collection by mistake. The cedar fragments were carbon dated soon afterwards, and the date came out to be about 500 years earlier than we think the Great Pyramids were built, plus or minus 150 years as there is an error factor with these tests. 
To place this in context, the larger body of carbon dating that's been done on materials from the pyramids mostly shows that they do date from the 4th dynasty period. None that I'm aware have shown a date significantly later, but a relatively small group of tests, including the Dixon Relic Cedar, show an earlier period. I'm not aware of any showing more than about a 500 year gap earlier. Now there are some possible explanations for this. One is that we know that pharaohs later in Egypt's history, for example in the New Kingdom, would bring antiquities from earlier time frames, earlier dynasties, into their tombs, possibly as a way of establishing continuity or respect for their ancestors. It's also worth noting that when you test wood and carbon data, you're establishing the age of the wood itself. And cedar trees can have a lifespan of up to a thousand years, so this simply could have been wood from an older part of the tree. This is part of a well-known phenomenon known as the old wood problem. When dealing with this type of carbon dating, there is an established scientific principle which presupposes the age is at least as young, if not younger, than the youngest sample that you find. So both on grounds of which samples are likely to be the most accurate and which samples have the most number, that is, comparison of sample size, the fourth dynasty date is the most likely based on the carbon evidence. This did not prevent a whole lot of hue and cry from going up when the Dixon Cedar dating was released and claims of, see, the mainstream view is wrong. Let's assume the worst case scenario, that you push the date 500 years earlier. What does that demonstrate? I mean, we still have no evidence of a civilization that would have been capable of building the pyramids 500 years earlier. What was going on at that point in time in this part of the world? It was a time of Narmer. It was the formation of the first dynasty, establishment of the old kingdom. There's a lot of strife and growing pains and disunity. There's no indication of any other more powerful civilization or any indication that early first dynasty Egyptians would have been capable of building the pyramids. It's a lot harder to fit them into that time frame than it is into the fourth dynasty. Probably the most compelling piece of evidence for the higher civilization theory is not even about the pyramids themselves. It's what's become known as the Sphinx water erosion hypothesis. It's very debatable what you can see by looking at the Sphinx itself. So much man-made damage and renovation, etc. has happened over the centuries and millennia that it's tough to know what happened when, what exactly the Sphinx originally looked like. But if you look at the wall behind the Sphinx, the enclosure wall, you can see channels that are cut into the rock by water. And the idea there is that water flow has carved away the softer sections of limestone, leaving the harder rock behind. The claim of the Sphinx water erosion hypothesis is that based on how water flows over the surrounding terrain on Giza, historical climatological analysis over the period from when the Sphinx was built until now, that this level of erosion simply could not have occurred in that time frame. And for it to happen, this whole complex would have had to be in place thousands and thousands of years earlier. So here we have something different entirely. We have a claim to direct physical evidence. This cannot be dismissed nearly as easily. To my mind, this is quite an illustrative point of contention. It really highlights a conflict in approach between looking at one piece of evidence in isolation versus a more holistic analytical approach. Consider these US dollar bills, or for those in other parts of the world, it would also apply to whatever currency you're most familiar with. And imagine that it's your job to determine whether currency is counterfeit or legal tender. Now, how would you go about this? One method would be to try to keep up on all the different ways that people are using to counterfeit bills and constantly watch for those. Another is to really immerse yourself in the minutia of what the actual bills are supposed to look like. So you look at the patterns and the imagery on the bills. What kind of paper? What kind of ink? Are there watermarks? Are there raised seals at different points? And you do that for long enough and you can close your eyes and just run your fingers over the bills and you'll be able to imagine, your mind will picture what's supposed to be there. And if there's any differences in the feel and texture, your brain's going to set off alarm bells. Or if you do a visual scan of a bill, anything that's out of place is going to announce itself to you because you're so attuned and familiar with what it should be. Circling back then, let's apply this holistic approach to the age of the Sphinx. And maybe we'll try to balance out this water erosion hypothesis with other evidence. Now in this illustration, we're broadening the scope a bit. This is an overview of the Sphinx area from the direction of the Nile, so north is to the right as the arrow indicates. In the lower left is the Khafre Valley Temple and then a causeway leading up and to the right from that along the Sphinx area. And the Khafre Valley Temple remains largely intact structurally. There's a few inscriptions there. Some of the original two dozen statues of Khafre are still present. 
So we have a clear picture that this was built in the time of Khafre. Obviously, it wasn't built before Khafre, or we wouldn't have the evidence from his reign. The north of that valley temple, or to the right on this diagram, we have the Sphinx Temple. In archaeological terms, it is said that the southern wall of the Sphinx Temple respects the north wall of the Khafre Valley Temple. What does that mean? Respects means shows evidence that the other object was there first, and this was built around it. Most of the northern wall of the Valley Temple was torn down and part of the Sphinx Temple built on those foundations. The foundation track of where that wall had been is still there. So we have solid evidence that the Sphinx Temple was built after the Khafre Valley Temple. On its own, that tells us nothing about the Sphinx itself. The Sphinx Temple could have been built much later in history than the Sphinx was. We need to remember that the Sphinx itself wasn't built and dragged into place. It was actually just dug out of the bedrock. And the surrounding area is what we call the Sphinx Quarry. Why is this important? Core blocks in the Sphinx Temple have been geologically matched to lower levels in the Sphinx Quarry. This tells us that the construction process for the Sphinx Temple and at least the lower part of the Sphinx are contemporaneous. The Sphinx couldn't be several thousand years older than the Fourth Dynasty and at the same time been dug out after the Khafre Valley Temple which was built during the Fourth Dynasty. Before we decide whether we're going to trust this evidence or the water erosion hypothesis, we should also consider additional facts such as that excavation on the Giza Plateau is by no means complete. There are still new discoveries being made. A fairly recent example of this is the 2010 discovery that mud enclosure walls further outside the Sphinx extend much further and in more directions than was initially thought. These mud walls probably date to the time of Thutmose IV in the mid-2nd millennium BCE, a little more than a thousand years after the time of Khafre, and were likely built to keep blowing sands out of the Sphinx area. The point here isn't so much the significance of those walls themselves, but that there are many periods of the history of Giza that we do not have enough information on to make conclusive determinations about water flow in the past. If that was the only evidence we had, it would probably still be convincing. But when you balance that against the sequencing evidence of the temples nearby the Sphinx, which I think is much more compelling, the total picture really tilts against the Sphinx water erosion hypothesis, in my view. Another common claim that is made is that if the Egyptians built the Great Pyramids, there would be hieroglyphics inside them, and there are none. And if you look, for example, at the Valley of the Kings, there's hieroglyphics all over their pyramids. Well, first of all, there might have actually been hieroglyphics there at some point. There is at least one historical source that claims there was. Arab historian Abu Jafar El Adrisi's 1245 History of the Pyramids includes this line. On the roof of the room are writings in the most ancient characters of the heathen priests. And this is referring to the Queen's Chamber in Khufu's Pyramid. Certainly there are no such writings there today, but during periods of renovation a lot of peeling plaster has been removed from the walls, salt buildup has been chiseled off. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that what El Adrisi described could have originally been there. Of course he also could have made it up, it's only one source. Even if we assume there were never any writings there, this would still not be all that remarkable. The earliest examples of hieroglyphics within the pyramids, known as the Pyramid Texts, don't appear until the time of Unas, the last ruler of the 5th dynasty, approximately 200 years after the time of Khufu and Khafre. Of course, this does not mean that Egyptian culture began at the end of the 5th dynasty. It isn't as if the lack of hieroglyphics in the Great Pyramids is an interruption of a consistent trend of them being there before and afterwards. The use of hieroglyphics evolved over time in ancient Egypt, as did their religious practices, their government structure, various other aspects of society, the Valley of the Kings wasn't used as a burial site till about a thousand years later. I must admit that I found this argument convincing the first time I heard it some decades ago. But that's because I didn't know enough to know how much I didn't know. This goes right back to the idea of viewing Egyptian history in a holistic manner. Once you understand the context, the absence of hieroglyphics in the Great Pyramids isn't even surprising. It's no better than if someone were to compare the culture and dress of the Napoleonic era in France and then look at modern-day France and conclude, well, these two couldn't have come from the same civilization, they're too different. A final sticking point to address is the idea of functionality or purpose of the pyramids. And this is an issue even for a number of people who believe the Egyptians were the architects. I think there's two related issues here. One is simply impracticality. Some simply protest against the idea that a culture would put forth the mammoth amount of effort required to build monuments such as the pyramids if they didn't have any practical purpose. This is very closely tied into the belief that the pyramids aren't actually tombs. The practicality argument has always struck me as being a particularly ill-informed one. 
There are few, if any, more common attributes of ancient cultures than extravagant, impractical burial rituals. A non-trivial amount of what we know about ancient cultures comes from those discoveries. While there are certainly differences in degree, what are we to make of the burial mounds in Europe and other parts of the world, the jade suits in China, the terracotta army, the fact that even in the Americas, Mayans and other cultures would bury their leaders with valuable, expensive goods? To my knowledge, there is no established practical purpose for the Nazca lines in Peru, Gobekli Tepe, Stonehenge. Archaeologists fall back on ritual or religious purpose. And we make a joke of that, but the reason that stereotype exists is we don't have any better ideas for what they were used for. When there's abundant evidence that extravagant or extreme efforts were made in the furtherance of so-called impractical goals, it's simply the best conclusion that we have. Say we briefly consider how the Apollo space program, as one modern example, would look under such an assessment. Was there any immediate, tangible benefit to society from transporting human beings to the surface of the moon and back? Clearly there were other motivations for going. Society was altered in unexpected ways as a result. The effort led to development of new technologies and skills that couldn't have been foreseen. But all of that is quite analogous to ancient Egypt. We don't have sufficient detail to know exactly what changes took place, but it's inconceivable that Egypt after building the Great Pyramids would have been exactly the same civilization as it was before. Developments in bureaucracy, in organization, in general construction and masonry, national focus and identity. These are but a few aspects of inevitable change as an outgrowth of such an undertaking. In regards to the pyramids themselves, we do have a number of reasons to believe they were designed and used as tombs. If you look in the largest internal chamber of the pyramid, such as the King's Chamber here in the Pyramid of Khufu, you see a large rectangular box. Appears to be a sarcophagus. It might not be, might be something else, but that's the most logical, natural conclusion. Parts of mummified corpses, although not always that of the pharaoh, have been found in pyramids both before and after the 4th dynasty. There's a consistent pattern going back to the 1st dynasty of burying members of the pharaoh's entourage nearby. And this is what we see near the Great Pyramid, Khufu's relatives, key advisors. But where is Khufu buried? The Great Pyramid is the only place that makes sense. It's the only larger structure nearby the other burials. Perhaps most importantly, the pyramid texts that we discussed earlier bear directly on this issue. They consist of ritual spells and personal instructions directed to the person who was buried. There are spells for protection of the body against scorpions and thieves until the soul is ready to move to the afterlife. What's the point of that anywhere but in a tomb where an important person is buried? There are also instructions for the soul to gain access to what they needed to do in the afterlife, easing the transition to their new role, and so on. I think part of the reason for this is a broad disconnect culturally. It's probably not even possible to fully imagine what it would have been like to live in ancient Egyptian culture, but it is important to get as close to that as we can. Not just in a notional or intellectual sense, but to really think about what it would have felt like living in a time where the baseline experience of modern life would have been incomprehensibly prosperous. Life is short and brutal. Many die in childbirth. If you are fortunate enough to survive that, the smallest cut or infection that we wouldn't pay a second thought to today in the age of modern medicine is life-threatening. The average person simply has no reasonable expectation of reaching what we would call old or even middle age. There's just too many potential hazards. And then you're taught from birth that the king or pharaoh is an omnipotent deity. People obey their orders without question. There's national pride involved. Skilled workers on the pyramids would have been given a place of honor to a degree. The powers that be are moving earth sometimes literally to get them the food and equipment they need. It's very dangerous work, but life is dangerous. Physically exhausting to be sure, but also a far more prestigious role than the average citizen would be able to attain in their normal life. Now, of course, we wouldn't look at it that way today, but what we would consider ridiculous and impractical makes a lot more sense if you look at it the way it would have been viewed at the time. And again, we can see parallels to this throughout history. Pre-Neolithic cultures that ranged much further than we expected crossed oceans long before we thought they were capable of it or would have any reason to. History often simply is not going to respect our presuppositions and confirm them. So if we do accept that the pyramids were most likely built by the 4th dynasty Egyptians, what makes them so compelling? By sheer volume, the Great Pyramid is not the largest pyramid in the world. That distinction belongs to the Cholula complex in modern-day Mexico, nearly twice the size at nearly 4.5 million cubic meters. 
When it comes to height, however, the Great Pyramids quite literally stand alone in their time and for a long time afterwards. They were the tallest man-made structures for almost four millennia, but even that's underselling it. Prior to the pyramids, the tallest structures were probably ziggurats in Mesopotamia, which eventually reached over 50 meters in height, but none at this time taller than about 13 to 15 meters. And then came the Pyramid of Djoser, a century or so before the Great Pyramids, and that reached a height of 62.6 meters. So this is a quantum leap upwards. Of course, it's much easier to just expand a building wider than it is to build it taller. Height requires not only a much better foundation, but also finding a way to move large amounts of material that far into the air. The trio of pyramids that Sneferu was given credit for were all about 90 meters to a little over 100 meters, culminating in the Red Pyramid at 105. And then comes the Great Pyramid of Khufu, an original height of 146.5 meters, and it now stands at between 138 to 139. So in less than 150 years, from prior to the Pyramid of Djoser to the Great Pyramid of Khufu, you have a jump of more than 10 times the tallest man-made structure on Earth that we know of. And it would be almost 3,900 years before this was surpassed, narrowly. The spire of the Lincoln Cathedral was completed in about 1311, and it reached a height of approximately 160 meters. That relatively marginal increase would remain at least close to the standard until the Eiffel Tower in 1889 reached 324 meters. Another way of putting this is that it literally took the Industrial Revolution to depose the Great Pyramids as one of the tallest structures in the world, and 97% of the intervening time from when they were built to the present day. Even taking that fact alone by itself, the Great Pyramid is simply astonishing. And of course, we're just getting started here. Much has also been made of the fact that the corners of the pyramid are oriented north, south, east, and west. But this is not particularly noteworthy in my opinion. Well before the time of the pyramids, accurate determination of the cardinal directions of the compass was known by many cultures, and it would probably actually be more remarkable if the pyramids weren't oriented in that direction. The level of engineering precision of the Great Pyramid is really another astonishing aspect, though. The Great Pyramid isn't actually a four-sided structure, but an eight-sided one. There is a subtle and symmetrical concave indentation in the middle of what appear to be the four sides. This probably wasn't discovered until an overflight by an airplane in 1940. For a moment, just think about how epic that is. A secret hidden in plain sight for possibly over four millennia. Certainly for most of that time. The distances from corner to corner are nearly identical, with a variance of less than three centimeters. The cornerstones themselves are made in a ball and socket formation, so that the pyramid is effectively anchored directly into the ground. Famously, and perhaps most remarkably, in the internal chambers, the stones are cut so precisely that you literally can't slide a credit card in between them. Even with all those visible testaments to precision and planning, at least as amazing to many observers and impossible to some of them, is how quickly the pyramids were erected. The Cholula complex we mentioned earlier was added on to gradually, built over generations and centuries. Assuming the Great Pyramid was built roughly over the entirety of Khufu's reign, as we think it was, started early and finished probably just after his death, it would have taken 25 to 30 years. There are an estimated 2.3 million blocks in the pyramid, average weight of about 2.5 tons each. So one 2.5 ton block would have had to been placed roughly every 3 minutes or a little bit longer of daylight for that entire period. And this is really where the concept of Okay, how could they possibly have done this really starts to hit hard. Most of the stone was limestone from quarries nearby, and they have done studies showing that this level of production from those quarries would have been possible. Not a lot higher, but it could have been done. The granite from the interior chambers, though, comes from Aswan, several hundred kilometers to the south, and that would have had to have been floated up the Nile, as were the casing stones, as we know from the Journal of Mer. So simply quarrying and producing enough stone possible, but would require maximum year-round effort of thousands of workers. Best estimates I've seen is that there would have been as many as 20,000 workers at the Giza site alone. And on top of that, the quarrying and shipping from Aswan, teams such as the one that Mayor oversaw, massive agricultural effort definitely required to feed and supply the workers. It's not a stretch to conclude that factoring in all different aspects and locations there may have been at peak operation as many as 40,000 people involved. Another obstacle would have been precision cutting of the blocks. 
Even with modern capabilities, cutting granite blocks is a time-consuming process. But it's important to remember that in the Great Pyramid, there are only about 8,000 tons of granite. That sure sounds like a lot initially, but it's actually less than one-seventh of a percent of the total amount of material. Nearly all of it is limestone, and so far as we can tell, most of it was not cut with exacting accuracy. Sections of the pyramid not intended to be exposed to view simply were cut much more roughly. Gypsum, mortar, and debris were simply jammed into the gaps between the blocks in these areas. That gives perspective to the scope, but the question still stands. How did the Egyptians do precise cuts of massive granite blocks with no tools of a material harder than copper? The closest we've come to really determining an answer here is limited experimental recreations of possible techniques the Egyptians could have used. But there's very little in the way of direct evidence that the Egyptians did use a particular method. There are some bits and pieces we can fit together, however. They were capable of core drilling, likely by around 3000 BCE, either with the use of a simple handle or a bow drill, such as the one shown here. The idea is to twirl a copper tube as quickly as possible, combined with water, some other liquid, an abrasive such as sand, and it's actually the abrasive that does the cutting, not the copper itself. We don't have any evidence the Egyptians adapted this technique to use copper saws, but they could have. That's been shown to be able to cut granite blocks very slowly, as in maybe a centimeter an hour. Rather than sawing, though, a couple of other methods are probably more likely. Core drilling a moderate distance into the rock is one option. If wooden poles were then placed into the resulting holes and soaked with water, the wood would expand and the pressure would crack and split the rock. Similarly, wooden wedges could have been used to expand any cracks. Or another possibility is fire setting, which we've discussed before on the channel. The idea being to heat the rock as much as possible in an area you want to split, and that causes it to become much more fragile. Another question arises from tool marks found in some of the stones near the pyramids. To the best of my understanding, the great majority of them can be explained by methods we've been able to recreate, but not all of them. It's a bit difficult to describe, but a series of closely spaced parallel grooves or ridges can sometimes be seen. I think these genuinely do remain a mystery. Regardless what method was used to split the stones, further refinement would be needed on some of them. By wearing away all the excess material with dolerite hammer stones, most likely, these are found all over the place in the workers' village, then you'd be using abrasives or a hammer and chisel type approach for the final finished quality. And it's easy to imagine a scenario where only the most skilled and prized laborers would be permitted to work on the granite and they would be very well taken care of indeed. It would be a relative catastrophe if any of the granite blocks were to be ruined, particularly the massive granite beams 50 to 70 tons each that were used in the king's chamber. Work on the granite could very well have begun at the onset of the building project while the great balance of the laborers were busy getting the limestone levels in place. Less sensitive work, but it also wouldn't take nearly as long per block. Another big question is, how do you haul these blocks into place? It'd be one thing to get them all to the pyramid site, get them all finished and ready to be placed together, but how could they have elevated multi-ton blocks hundreds of feet into the air? The most common traditional explanation is the ramp method. It appears the Egyptians were aware that wetting the sand before pulling a large object over it would make the task easier, reducing the friction and therefore the pulling force required by about half. Even so, the force required to move multi-ton blocks has traditionally limited the range of possible inclinations of a ramp to about 8 degrees. That creates quite a problem though. An 8 degree ramp that would reach all the way to the summit of the Great Pyramid would require as much material as the pyramid itself. That just seems unfeasible, but what other alternatives are there? This is another area where modern scholarship potentially may have broadened the range of possibilities. A very interesting discovery was made three years ago at the Alabaster Quarry in Hatnab. This is how project co-director Yanis Gordon described what they found. The system is composed of a central ramp flanked by two staircases with numerous post holes. Using a sled which carried a stone block and was attached with ropes to these wooden posts, Ancient Egyptians were able to pull up the alabaster blocks out of the quarry on very steep slopes of 20% or more. There's another piece of evidence that may play a complementary role in this idea. It was discovered nearly a century ago, and I think it's been largely forgotten, partly because at that time we didn't know what the significance might be. In the late 1930s, Dr. Salim Hassan was the deputy director of the Egyptian Antiquities Service. 
Hassan reported finding at least two of these objects, basalt pulleys. A hole is clearly drilled through the base and you've got a series of three grooves for holding ropes. The most likely practical use of these pulleys that I've come across would be to slide the pulley over a wooden pole and then use ropes to apply a braking force, if you will, to hold a large object in place. This would allow a sled with a block on it, such as has been described here, to be held at a specific location while the pulling team readjusted their ropes or whatever else needed to happen. There's definitely a big difference between pulling stone blocks a short distance out of an alabaster quarry at an increased incline and hauling them up on a huge ramp up the side of a pyramid hundreds of feet in the air repeatedly. For the moment though, let's accept the theoretical possibility that using this kind of a system, the Egyptians could have built ramps that are about 20 degrees in elevation instead of 8 degrees, making an external ramp approach something that might be within the realm of possibility. Perhaps more likely is the combination of a smaller external ramp with some other techniques. Two-thirds of the volume of the pyramid is in the bottom one-third of the height. Let's say you construct a 20 degree external ramp then that only reaches a height of about 50 meters. It would only need to be about 150 or 160 meters long. That's very possible. That still leaves about 100 meters of the pyramid left though. And while the blocks higher up are not as large as the blocks lower down, that's still years and years of work remaining. The leading theory on how the top of the pyramid was handled probably is the inset or interior spiral ramp idea. Just imagine the largest, tallest spiral staircase you've ever seen, only instead of actually building that or some sort of ramp system, this ramp is simply made out of the blocks that are not put in place. Some of the outer blocks and exterior casing stones simply are not put in place, so it's literally the material of the pyramid itself that forms the ramp going upwards and upwards. Interestingly, there is a bit of actual evidence for this as well. The Scan Pyramids Project, using modern scanning techniques, has discovered an area of lower density near the top of the pyramid that appears that it could have been part of such a ramp system. As the requirements for bearing weight would not have been as high near the top, perhaps those areas were simply never filled in. Another possibility that I find intriguing is the idea of a lift shaft, or if you will, an ancient Egyptian elevator. Under this approach, hydraulics would have been used probably by the use of a square shaft roughly in the middle of the pyramid to elevate not just the blocks, but also workers and equipment and so on up the middle of the pyramid to whatever level they needed to reach. It's easy to have an initial reaction that this is simply preposterous, but I actually don't think it's as far-fetched as it might sound. Hydraulic sounds like a complex, modern, scientific term, but all it really means is using liquid pressure. Since liquids don't compress when under pressure, if you apply a force to one end of a body of liquid, you're creating a force at the other end. Exactly how advanced the Egyptians were at this time in terms of harnessing the power of water is really difficult to determine. At a minimum, though, they were definitely practiced and skilled in controlling the annual inundation of the Nile. We have imagery of at least basic irrigation techniques going back 500 years earlier to the Scorpion Macehead. The Giza Harbor, which we've previously discussed, definitely shows a certain level of sophistication as well. It's a long distance from there to concluding the Egyptians had the engineering capability for a counterweight system and valves and everything else that would have been necessary. But as we've noted, the Great Pyramid itself shows tremendous engineering capabilities. So while it's definitely more speculative than the spiral ramp theory, I don't think the lift shaft should be completely discounted. Of course, it might not even be an either or situation. Perhaps both methods were used. There's a number of possibilities that tie in here. For example, we don't know why the Grand Gallery exists. There's no apparent writing or ceremonial use. It's much larger than the other passages it connects. It's almost 9 meters high and about 50 meters long. But advocates of the lift shaft theory think that it could possibly have been used as a water tank, and so it was simply made larger to accommodate the water it needed to store. That bit of it just seems too convenient to me, however. There were excavations begun underneath the Great Pyramid and clearly not finished. There are some shafts within the pyramid that we don't fully understand why they're there. If the Grand Gallery wasn't intended to be permanently part of the structure, it's more than low enough that it could have been filled in later. It's also been theorized that the ball and socket cornerstone construction and the eight-sided structure of the pyramid could play a role as well. Those would possibly allow for greater structural integrity given the large amount of water pressure that a lift shaft system would require.
There's a variety of burial shafts in Giza, many of them unexplored simply due to them being flooded. Even looking earlier in time, though, to the Pyramid of Djoser, there's a 28-meter directly vertical shaft leading to the burial chamber. Of course, many of these wouldn't have been used for hydraulic purposes, perhaps none of them were, but clearly the Egyptians had some kind of method of raising and lowering large quantities of materials in these shafts. Contemplating how the pyramids were built doesn't exhaust the mysteries around the Great Pyramids either. One frequent question is why did the Egyptians stop building them late in the 4th dynasty? A theory that's been floated is the high water table compelled them to stop building at Giza at least, but actually if there was some type of hydraulic component to the construction, that could have been an asset, in fact one of the reasons why Giza was even chosen. There also are a couple of really good reasons why the Egyptians scaled back their pyramid building efforts. One is simply that at the end of the 4th dynasty into the 5th dynasty, Egypt was not as prosperous as it had been. An even more likely scenario, in my opinion, is that the pharaohs simply didn't live long enough. That sounds strange, but Khufu ruled for, we think, at least 26 years. Khafre ruled for 26 years. Menkare, about 20 years, roughly. None of the next several pharaohs even ruled half that long, most of them less than 10 years. So it's entirely possible they wanted to keep building on the same scale, but clearly there simply wasn't enough time for that, and so new traditions evolved, the consensus view of most Egyptologists is that the power of the pharaohs began to decline, the religious bureaucracy began to become more ascendant, and priorities simply permanently shifted. Many structural questions remain as well. Most of the Great Pyramid hasn't been seen since shortly after it was first put in place. It's such a massive structure that so much of it is simply hidden behind the visible material. The sheer stability of the pyramid indicates that it must be largely solid rock, but not necessarily completely. For a long time, there's been great speculation about hidden chambers that we haven't found yet. But in recent decades, modern scanning techniques, as we referenced earlier, have really put some light on that. It's no longer really speculation. There's at least one, and probably more, voids or empty spaces within the pyramid. And this doesn't just apply to the Great Pyramid of Khufu, of course. We know there are openings in the ground underneath the Sphinx, for example, most likely natural caves or fissures. And while careful study can determine where there's an opening or an area of lower density, that's about all we can tell. The exact size of an area or exactly what's in it is well beyond current non-invasive capabilities. One area that we can be fully confident contains an empty zone within the Great Pyramid is here directly behind the original entrance. There are structural clues as well. We can see the large chevrons over the entryway. But these would not have been just for the purpose of protecting the passageway, which slopes significantly downward once you get into the pyramid. There is something, be it just empty space or something more, behind and below those chevrons which may extend further back into the structure for all we know. The King's Chamber raises even more questions. Once again we have the chevrons at the very top protecting the area structurally. This was a technique that the Egyptians had used long before the Great Pyramid of Khufu. Then there are the mysterious and so far unexplained layers of granite beams. These have been traditionally and quite incorrectly termed relieving chambers. When first discovered, it was thought that they were intended to relieve the structural pressure on the chamber. But they don't actually do that. So once again, we fall back on was there a ceremonial purpose that we don't understand? It's even possible that they were a mistake. A very large, expensive, time-consuming mistake, but the Egyptians weren't perfect and there was progression even between Khufu's and Khafre's pyramid in terms of some of the construction. Another topic where much theorizing has been done, but nothing solid so far as I'm aware. Then above the Grand Gallery and to the side, if you will, of the King's Chamber is another void, a much larger one, about 30 meters long. It's similar in size to the Grand Gallery as best we can estimate. Is it a second Grand Gallery? Does it connect to yet another chamber further up the pyramid, or was it initially designed to do that, or for some other purpose? There's at least one more interesting piece here. To my knowledge, there is one and only one block in the walls of the king's chamber that is not load-bearing. This could have been at one point a passageway plugged by putting an appropriate size block there. It's in the direction of this larger void near the sarcophagus. In this picture, it's the most lower right block visible in the wall. Most of these mysteries are very likely to remain unexplained for the foreseeable future because the only way to get a firm answer would be to tear apart large sections of the pyramid and that's just not going to happen. It's certainly a great frustration for the curious-minded 
But Egypt, of course, has a very valid interest in protecting their historical sites. This is something we can see, of course, around the world. But another good comparable example, I think, is the Terracotta Army in China. They've done a lot of excavation there, and exposure to the elements has significantly damaged the army. There's a lot of debate due to competing interests, seismic activity in the area, potential for damaging artifacts, how much of the huge surrounding complex should be excavated. There's an imperial palace, a mortuary temple. So much could be learned, but in most of these situations, it's not zero cost. And it is very important to respect these cultures' right to treat their own historical sites as they choose. There's an additional point in favor of the Egyptians having built the pyramids that doesn't become clear until you've examined their various features. They're jarringly low-tech in terms of the materials involved. Obviously impressive skill, craftsmanship, and planning, but the materials are self-evidently and inherently ancient. It's not just a case of there being no steel, titanium, electronics, modern equipment. We don't even find any bronze or iron incorporated into the structures themselves. As an example of the significance of this, consider the Temple of Hephaestos, built by the Greeks in the early to mid 5th century AD. Here it is plain to see that the columns are comprised of numerous sections. The Greeks almost never used mortar. What they did use are bronze or iron pins and clamps to hold the stones together. Examples such as this beg the question, why are the pyramids built entirely of stone and mortar? Why do we see no more advanced materials at all? Given the effort involved and the obvious engineering prowess of those who built them, the only logical conclusion is they did not have anything better, which means the society responsible had not yet advanced to using bronze or any better materials. In other words, they were not significantly more advanced than the 4th Dynasty Egyptians. From my perspective, there is a significant danger of losing yourself in the minutia of how did they build this, what might have happened here, and in doing that, not keeping a proper perspective on the big picture. The ability demonstrated in the Great Pyramids to focus a great amount of effort and resources on a task, in and of itself, that's a monumental achievement for human civilization. The skills, the national identity, developments in craftsmanship that occurred just to get this done are staggering, even to the limited extent we even understand them. Now, you might well argue they should have put them to better use, but I'm just talking about the fact that it happened, period. I think that's worthy of respect and admiration in its own right. And just to make it personal, what would you or I be willing to sacrifice 30 years of not just our own sweat and labor, but that of a sizable portion of our society to achieve? I dare say most of us, if we're being honest with ourselves, we'd be hard-pressed to say that we'd sacrifice that much for anything. So I think that regardless of what other judgments we might wish to make, we need to recognize that what the Egyptians achieved at the time they achieved it is simply nothing short of astonishing. The Great Pyramid of Giza remains the only one of the seven ancient wonders of the world that remains largely intact. And it's still an engineering marvel to us today, even though we've achieved quantum leaps beyond them in terms of our technology and knowledge. As for me, some of what I've picked up from focusing on this period of history recently is just to aspire to learn from the example of how powerful a unified purpose can be. It can make possible accomplishments that you would otherwise dismiss as fantasy. If the pyramids didn't exist, would we believe the Egyptians capable of producing them? Absolutely not. And I would also aspire not to ever consider those of other cultures or times as inferior or primitive in a negative sense. They clearly met and defeated challenges that would break me utterly, and most people in the modern world, I would think. It's a valid question to ask ourselves, what have we done in our own lives that's going to be worthy of remembering 50 years after we're gone? And the pyramids are almost 100 times that old. So as far as it depends on me, I would wish to give the Egyptians of the 4th Dynasty the respect their accomplishment demands. I hope you found this journey into the past interesting, and I thank you all for watching.